Okay. Welcome everybody to our SCI Cafe. We're hoping you can hear us. We had a little bit of uh, mix up on, on our sound. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, the SCI Cafe is a series of the uh, Apalachicola National Estuarine Research Reserve. And my name is Anita Grove. Um, the uh, This month's SCI Cafe, we welcome Beth, artist Beth Appleton. Um, we have another opportunity to work with Beth. We've had a couple of exhibits here and, and some other Sci Cafes. We're excited that she's um, to be working with her again. Uh, also, Megan Lamb, our uh, stewardship coordinator and marine biologist, is joining us today, and Melanie Humble uh, with our education section. So, Megan, you want to take it away? Thanks. Um, thank you, Anita, and thank you, Beth, for inviting me to participate today. Um, I've been a Beth Appleton art fan for a really long time, and uh, one of the things that really resonates with me about her work are the layers of meaning and level of detail that she includes in her pieces, from the macro to a micro scale. Um, so I started collecting plankton in our estuary about 10 years ago while working with some uh, Florida A&M University graduate students as part of their research projects. I started um, working on a project looking at the ecology of zooplankton in the bay here at Ainer about five or six years ago. And sometimes while I was out sampling, I would throw the plankton net for, out for an extra toe and save an extra bottle of plankton to pass along to Beth. So I'd like to think I helped a teeny bit with some of her artwork um, but the slideshow that you see playing is made uh, from still photos I've taken while doing plankton counts um, on the Apalachicola Bay plankton samples. Uh, but really, Beth invited me here today to talk a little bit about the biology and the ecology of plankton, why it's so important for our ecosystem, um, from our local estuary to the entire Gulf of Mexico and beyond, um, but also how this ecology is significant for our human communities. Um, so when you look at the bay out the window, um, what are what is in those drops of water? Uh, there's a lot of living things in those drops of water, from bacteria to fungus to microalgae, protozoans, and plankton. Um, there's also a lot of non-living components in there: salt crystals, suspended sediments, uh, sand, dirt, nutrients. Um, so there's a lot that you can't see with your naked eye out there in that water. Uh, plankton, um, quite simply, is it's a group of small plants and animals that are unable to swim against the current. Um, this comes from the Greek word planktos, which means wanderer or drifter. And then um, plankton itself is split into two groups of plants and animals. So phytoplankton is the plant plankton. Um, this comes from the Greek word phyton, which means plant, so plant wanderer. And then zooplankton. Uh, that's the animal plankton, and that's um, from the Greek root of Zion, or living being, so living being wanderer. So these, um, all these things are out there wandering around in the water. Uh, zooplankton includes a lot of groups. Each, you know, phyto and zooplankton both include many groups. Um, so the work here that we do here at Ainer looks more at the zooplankton, which can include crustaceans, copepod, worms, medusae, which are like jellyfish. Um, and other groups. It also includes the juvenile stage of some animals, that be things like crab, shrimp, barnacles, oyster, and fish that may only spend part of their lives in the plankton before they get bigger um, and can't swim against those currents or they settle out like oysters. Um, they might spend only a part of their life cycle as plankton, but it's a very important part. Um, so plankton and Phytoplankton is found anywhere in the world that it's moist. This might be salt or fresh water uh, in estuaries, but also even in damp soil, you can find plankton and phytoplankton. And I'm going to focus in a little more on the phytoplankton um, today. Uh, diatoms are the most common group of these phytoplankton, and they feature prominently in Beth's work. They're an extremely diverse group of organisms. It's estimated there are between 
20,000 to 2 million uh, diatom species in the world. So obviously we haven't, we just uh, touched the tip of the iceberg in identifying these species. Um, they're single-celled organisms, but they can join to form very large colonies. Um, and their shape and structure are very symmetrical. Um, so I think you see that in um, a lot of the artwork. If you, you know, step up close to Beth's work and zoom in, you can see those symmetrical shapes of diatoms. Uh, and also they um, have clear cell walls that are made of silica. So we say they live in glass houses. Um, and many of them have very intricate detailed patterns in these walls that you can only see using very high powered electric micro microscopes. Um, but diatoms are extremely important because they're the base of the world's food web. Um, they're plants. So if you recall photosynthesis, they take sunlight and nutrient energy and convert it into usable energy for the food web. Um, and they're responsible, diatoms alone are responsible for 40 to 60% of the world's primary production. Um, and they also produce a quarter to a half of the Earth's oxygen and fix 20 to 30% um, of the carbon fixation that's going on on the planet is happening with diatoms. Um, so they also produce these long chain fatty acids. They're very energy rich molecules, which is why things like to eat them. They're the base of the food web. Um, and so they're eaten by animals from invertebrate to small fish, um, and they help link that food web to the higher levels um, that, um, and up and up and have uh, ripple effects throughout the entire, um, not only the food web of the marine world, um, but then linked to uh, the food web on the land. Um, so phytoplankton productivity, like all plants, it can vary across seasons. Um, so this might vary with temperature or light energy available. You think the winter time it's colder and the daylight hours are shorter. So um, land plants, might not, they don't really have a growing season depending on where you are in the world and what the plant is, of course, in the winter, but maybe they grow more in the warmer months where there's more sunlight available. Um, and growth of phytoplankton also varies with nutrient supply. So um, nutrients, remember they use nutrients as food, um, are carried by, in our ecosystem, nutrients are carried downriver. Um, and they're also come from runoff from the floodplain when the floodplain is filled and then um, runs off into the river and forests. And the Apalachicola River is a large alluvial river, <laughs> which means um, we have, we experience spring floods, which carry sediment and nutrients um, down river and into this food web uh, for plankton. So changes in a watershed's river flows, uh, thus diverting nutrient inputs away from the watershed or the Apalachicola Bay in our local case, um, can lower phytoplankton productivity. Um, and changes in primary productivity will have a ripple effect uh, throughout the food web. So, um, so changes um, can result in changes to the higher trophic levels. And we think when we say higher trophic levels, the upper areas, we start thinking of you know, the larger fish that we appreciate, game fish, um, crabs, shrimp, things that we harvest commercially. Um, so changes in plankton can mean changes to the entire food web. Uh, diatoms are also really interesting. Some species are very picky about the conditions they like to grow in. Um, so that gives us some interesting applications. Um, so if they have a really specific preference for say pH or salinity or oxygen levels, um, a change in diatom communities can be used to um, indicate a change in water quality conditions. Uh, and um, we can also look at fossil records of diatoms. And if we can see what fossil, uh, what diatoms were present in the past by these fossil records, that can also give us an indication of what environmental conditions were um, like in the past. And there's also a lot of interesting commercial uses um, for diatoms. Um, so diatoms can be um, grown and harvested as a biofuel. There's a lot of research going on in that industry right now. Uh, and then diatomite is commercially mined sedimentary rock, which is made of fossilized diatoms. Um, so remember we said that diatoms have a silica or glass shell essentially. Um, so diatomaceous earth 
um, is something that a lot of people have used in their gardens. Um, it targets insect pests. Um, so it has garden applications, but also um, can we use, some people use it um, to target fleas. Um, some people say it's a health supplement for humans to um, treat things like high cholesterol. Now I do wanna say I'm not a medical expert. Um, so you know, if you are considering that kind of thing, talk to your doctor for medical advice. Um, but the walls of silica, because they're glass or abrasive, so they can be used in toothpaste and as exfoliant for skin. Um, it's, uh, it can be used in pet litter um, and also as filtration for drinking water. So the, um, the diatomaceous um, sediments can be used to remove cysts and algae and asbestos in drinking water. Um, and during World War II, this was used as a potable water in field camps. Um, it's still used for drinking water today um, and used in filtration equipment for fish tanks and also some beer and wine production. Um, so uh, I, I think we can all agree that diatomaceous earth has very important modern day applications. Um, and then also interestingly, um, silica from the diatoms, um, it's been used as a stabilizing um, agent for nitroglycerin um, in a portable stick, which we call dynamite. So. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed learning a little more about the plankton communities and it helps you appreciate um, our local waterways and why they're so important. Um, and next time you look at a drop of water, maybe you'll think of not only the beauty of the organisms there, but also consider their ecological importance and economic applications. Um, so why it's important for us all to be good stewards um, to, around for the world around us. Um, so up next, um, we are going to uh, hear from Melanie Humble. Um, Melanie is an education specialist here at Ainer. She's a lifelong educator and artist, and she's going to uh, talk about her own work at the reserve and journaling as a way to see nature, and then discuss more with Beth about how science inspires her art. Thank you, Megan. Beth uh, graciously invited our education department to integrate our use of art into the exhibition. We teach nature journaling as a way to foster close observation, curiosity, and creative thinking. It's a tool used by scientists, naturalists, poets, writers, and artists, and Beth's very own journal is in the exhibit, kind of like looking behind the curtain. Beth Appleton is an extraordinary artist who seems to infuse her art with everything she experiences, from her early days with the Wiki Watchy Mermaids to revelations derived from the Apalachicola Bay water. In 2015, she had her first exhibit here. The most recent piece in the current exhibit is called The Sea Hag, a stunning self-portrait, which is simultaneously a portrait of an entire life and of the living, breathing, pulsating ocean itself. This exhibit is subtitled Art and Science, a Creative Exchange, which leads me to my first question. What does the fusion of science and art bring that either alone cannot, Appleton? Hi, Melanie. Thank you so much for all your help. Melanie has been such a good support and uh, brought me lots of smiles and that's terrific. I think we need to, we need that loosening up and that dialogue with one another. And Melanie has brought all those wonderful things. Um, I'm excited to talk to all of you. I do envision our audience that's with us today. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so uh, I hope you'll excuse me because I'm going to be referring to my notes. If I didn't do this, I would be wandering so far down off topic and Melanie would be going with me. So, uh, but we're gonna try, we're gonna try to stay on the questions that we have planned. So thank you, Melanie. So this is a great, a great question Melanie brings up, bringing art and science together. It, gives us this promising new path and its potential, I believe, is really yet to be realized. Um, collaborations, I will tell you, as you know, they take more time. They take more effort. We've been working at this, uh, brainstorming back and forth way before Christmas. Um, so we met often together as a team 
Um, and during that process, I believe we've worked out a lot of brand new ideas and together we've certainly accomplished more than I could ever have done by myself. Working with Apalachicola National, I always have to look, Estherine Research Team, and from now I'm gonna call it Anner. Uh, that's just been inspiring. And I'll come away with ideas that later I take back to my life and my artwork. And hopefully the same transfer is happening now for all our team and the viewers, the people that have go, will go see the exhibit itself. And there's a lot of people that have already seen uh, the show. Some of our new ideas do show uh, up on the walls and some can't be seen or even known yet because we've just opened. Um, and now we're just starting to interact with the public. Witnessing that spark, that exchange is really a delight. And um, yeah. it really is our reward. And I think Melanie and the team get to experience and see that as the public comes in to see the exhibition. May I give an, may I give an example of that recently? Well, you have seen, uh, you have sent me pages that I can see. We have an exhibition book up and we invite the public to write a poem, uh, you know, a comment or just leave their email address if they'd like to become part of our emailing list. Um, but and they have responded with little doodles delightful little uh renderings and and i think you could explain maybe more about that as well, well Melanie. I, just, I just remember very recently taking someone from the microscope where they could see the barnacles and then to see one of kennedy's photos and then i took them to the sea hag to see her chin which has barnacles on it it was just a lovely <laughs> Well, this leads me to my second question, which is Picasso said, art is the lie that enables us to realize the truth. What truths about the natural world would you hope your art will reveal to a viewer? Although we understand there's not one type of viewer and one type of truth. It's a great question. As an artist, I'm really expected to embellish. Um, and, and exaggerate, it's really a tool in my art box. I learned this early. Um, there's no set rules for me, um, it, you know, to guide my work. Inspiration is very intuitive. So this is very, very different than the field of science, which is based on really evidence, measurable data about the physical and the natural world. And yet, see, we know that by even working with it as we've gone through this, these months of planning, uh, art and science has really fascinating intersections. My work with the diatoms and other micro life, uh, that's from actual observation. These works behind you, they're prints, they're micrographs. They, they are actually what I saw when I looked under a microscope, but I use these in my work um, to exaggerate with pattern and color. I supersize them to blow them up um, so that because they stay mainly hidden, I like to be able to blow them up so the viewer can easily see them and start understanding what they're about. So I try to create dynamic art that would leave the viewer to their own personal discovery. And yet I know tr that art truly does lie in the eyes of the beholder. I love that each viewer will take away something entirely different. That, that you mentioned the magic word. So I'm gonna, I hope I don't throw you off, but I'm gonna switch question three and four. That's said to me uh, in an exchange and I'm quoting her here, pattern is not just out there somewhere, it's personal. And another colleague of ours, Kennedy, whose photography is in the exhibit, was saying that as humans, we have to recognize patterns to survive in the world. Could you talk about patterns in your art? Absolutely. I look for connectors. I think I always have. And um, similarities that I find in, in nature. There are iconic shapes that nature just loves to repeat. These surround us in, um, 
it's not uh, it's not surprising that they also can be found in the tiny world that you know the microscopic world of our waters um so that those um patterns they turn up in my art they feel very intuitive they're personal i feel like they're innate um for example i started doing these circular mandalas back in 1992 um, I'm diving back in time now, but I just love uh, designing my art in circles and repeating those patterns. And uh, I, so I've been doing this for years. So I was thrilled in 2011 when I looked in the microscope at a drop of water and started seeing diatoms, not all of them, but a, a great body of um, diatoms are centric circular figure, circular in shape, and they are, have intricate, delicate patterns, and they're so diverse, as Megan mentioned in her, her talk. Um, so um, I connected with them. I, it became personal for me. Uh, I really connected with my past and what I was seeing. So just <laughs> like butterflies, bees, and all those things that rely on pattern to survive, humans connect with them too, and the art reflects this. If you if you come to the exhibit, you get a little secret code uh, sheet that it, where Beth has explained that this is the shape of a salt crystal, or so it's almost like some of the young people who come to the exhibit see it as a detective work. You know, it's it's very cool that you have a key with it. So I felt kind of a little bit validated by uh, as if I needed it, but CERN, which is where the atom smasher or the Hadron Collider is in Switzerland, it's a miles long. I don't know if everybody knows what that is, but they have an artist in residence program, even at the most high level of physics occurring in our world. And it led me to ask Beth if there was a place or a piece of technology or a mystery that she would like to experience as an artist. I could go on and on about this. That's why the notes are important. Um, it would be fascinating to go to CERN as an artist in residence, and I will never say never on that one. That would be amazing. But I do love connecting where I live regionally. I've always done this. Um, for me, that means the, the Big Bend area, but I've, I've stretched past it too. I love exhibiting at this center, at, at the nurse center, lo our local nurse center, and it, uh, it sits right where a lot of my work was inspired. So the connection really makes sense for me. I, I do, you know, I would love to encourage other artists to see how they connect with their art, with science. There's a lot of opportunities there. Um, and uh, Anita mentioned that I had shown in, uh, Anna in 2015, which was a great experience for me. And what it did was it really set me up to then go to Mississippi and do a collaboration with the NUR there. There are uh, 30, I believe, different NURs all around the country. And they are coastal sites that are designed to protect and study our estuaries. And I do, would not ever have time to go to all 30 of them because I try to test their water and then show them what uh, that what's under, you know, in their local waters. But I always thought it'd be fun to go to the one, especially in Hawaii. That's just sort of a dream <laughs> thought. Mm -hmm. So while I love the art, I do love the museums, the galleries, the, the museums, um, art centers. Uh, I'm really, I love showing in science minded spaces that don't usually exhibit art um well apparently uh, i just want i i would let in to say i also really uh i became aware that there's an opportunity uh for anyone to become a steward here at the local center and david and i hope to uh, volunteer and monitor one of these uh critical habitat sites in the coming year um so we'll be reaching out to y'all for that. We hope that works out and we have a lot to look forward to. When Beth says NERS, just in case anyone doesn't know, that's uh, the Estuarine Research Reserves all across the country. That's the acronym for it. Um, okay, next question. 
we've been like, using journals, as I said, to sort of slow down the eye and get students to really see something rather than just take a camera and put it on Instagram or TikTok or whatever. So I would like to ask you, what does it mean to you to really see something? I love your questions, Melanie. I think these are these are really well thought out questions. Uh, and I'll hope to answer them in a way. The the one about seeing, I mean, we could talk about so many ways to see, and we have. Uh, physically, and this is a simplified uh, version of what happens when we see, but light hits our retinal retina and it sends these electrical signals back to our brain and it interprets what we see. So I interpret that to mean that we can all look at the same thing and each of us will see or perceive a totally different thing, which is a bit mind blowing when you think about it. Um, some people lose their vision, so they see in a totally different way and they use some other sense or Sometimes we connect uh, and use all our senses at once. So there's many ways to talk about seeing, but another way uh, to see deals uh, more with being aware. And I think this is part of what you're focused on too. And this involves embracing that importance of an object or living thing. It gives it where we give pause and we linger on that. We learn more about it. We further explore it. And, you know, we become to love it, really. And this is what fuels my art. Uh, I believe we can learn to see more broadly, which would be extremely helpful. Our world could benefit from more creative exchanges. Um, well, that leads me to uh to the question, I, I might be out of order, I apologize, I don't mean to, okay. uh, but it seems logical to ask you how you use a journal to aid you in seeing, because people see your finished products and they're so intricate and they take so long. It's very interesting and I'm very grateful that you've given your journal, you can actually, if you come to the exhibit, pick up her journal and look at her notes and sketches and I wonder how you use it to in your process of creating? I think that's what's been exciting about our connection. Uh, you, This exhibit really has matched uh, things that uh, are close to how I work. So we've had a synchron, we have synchronized uh, uh, our discussions and just in sort of this wonderful way. Um, well, I've kept journals most of my life. They really serve as my diaries. Keeping one, I think here's the key. Keeping one slows me down and helps me step back. It, it really takes makes me take stock of my life as I live it. I jot down ideas, poems, sometimes lyrics for songs. Uh, they hold my sketches, like you say, and brainstorms. Um, I. I have a lot of them going at one time. I have a journal for my gardening. I've got one for always one at my art desk. Uh, and I'm really, really happy. This is where I got excited is that you at the center are connecting with journaling and you encourage it and your classes are beginning to do that. Um, I think that your collaboration walls uh, that were created for the, just for the exhibit. Uh, this exhibit is filled with beautiful journals, pages, and quotes, and it's just really a wonderful uh, way that you, an interactive part of the exhibit. I just really love it. So um, this is a great connection that we've made, the, the topic of journaling. I should say, um, we sort of stumbled around a bit and then we found a person called John Muir Laws who uses this kind of made a method of nature journaling just in case people want to try it and don't feel confident. You can uh, look him up online and he gives free lessons. I don't make any money from it. Should I say that? Sounds like I'm selling a shampoo. Or no, <laughs> this isn't about money for sure. And I'd like to butt <laughs> in and say Melanie's journal pages have 
just are totally wonderful. She's inspired me and everybody there at, at, on our team. And there's other team members uh, journaling now too, I understand. Uh, that's just great. I love it. Um, so this is my Oprah question, I feel. Is there any famous scientist or yeah, I'll stick to scientists, living or dead, with whom you would like to have collaborated or would like to collaborate? Oh my goodness. Um, really, there are just so many. Um, and I'll just have to wing it because I have a note about it, but maybe this is good that I'd actually have one thing I come off topic about, but Ernst Haeckel, uh, he lived in the 1800s and he just wrote he was a science he was everything zoologist marine biologist noted for you know identifying so many new species of life uh and that's i mean that's incredible right there but then he went on and you can look his work up uh easily online he went on to just illustrate the most fabulous drawings that you can imagine and I don't know that I, you said, who would I like to collaborate with? I don't know what I could bring to Ernst Haeckel's table, but I would love to talk to him and just go, ah, oh, how, I mean, I've worked with detail, but I, you know, I create one piece of work a year sometimes, but he was prolific and, uh, and we, you know, his gift is that we can see his work today. and. He, I believe, did embellish, and there were times that his work was criticized because he was such a scientist uh, and stuck to, you know, that field of science. So when, you know, when he started doing these incredible drawings, uh, I think that he veered with his embellishment and his use of color and pattern. As, you know, perhaps he embellished. Um, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised. When I look at his drawings, you can see that they are just fantastic. And um, so we don't, we don't always stay in our boxes, which is a good thing. Right, we don't. Uh, and that's the thing, there is that bridge. And I'm glad we came to this because that's what we're talking about here is that there is that wonderful bridge that we can find between art and science. and uh, Ernst Hankel certainly found it. Um, that was the last one in my question, so I can turn it over to Anita, or is there anything that you would like to add? Um, no, you've done a great job, and I don't know the timing right now. I just, I really would love to thank everyone that's been part of this, the team at Ainer, um, the people that are viewing have let me know some of them are here today, some old time friends. So uh, you know who you are and all of you, just thank you so much for being part of this. And Melanie, thanks for your contribution as well. Thank you so it's much, been, everybody. It's been my pleasure. And um, since I'm not being cut off, like I'm at the Oscars, I will say to those of you who haven't come to the exhibit that not only is Beth talented in dance and writing and journals and painting and assembling and all that stuff. She, and photography, she's made the most beautiful movie where she integrates it all and that's playing simultaneously during the exhibit. So I, I hope people will come and watch that as well. It's almost like an extra painting. There's a link to that. I think Anita's going to put that link up on the, um, when our audience uh, viewers get, uh, you know, at the end of this uh, event, I think they're going to find a link. Yes, we do have a link in the chat um, to all three films. Uh, there's a three minute and a 12 minute and there's another 12, 14 minute video and they're all different. Um, Alicia was going to play. We were having some sound difficulties on getting the sound of the movie to come through the uh, Go to meeting, and um, those of you who signed on early probably saw us struggling with that. But they, some of the videos were supposed to play while we were all talking, but we we're going to play the three minute video. Um, if you have a question, if you just raise your hand or put it in the chat, we'll start the movie and let that three minute movie go on.
Here we go. For some reason, we can't seem to get the sound to come up. Beth, if you want to narrate um, it all. I can just say uh, some of these, it's showing some of my Floridalas that I started in 1992. Um, there's a diatomarama that I made from the diatoms. Um, and I just talk about, this is a little jerky, um, but it, it talks about discovering for the first time what's in a drop of water, um, which Megan talked to us earlier about. Um, and I spent a lot of time on you. This is from unit four, um, uh, getting a microscope in 2011, I believe. And my first, I think it'll show you my first drop of water, what I was seeing, this is what I first saw. And then it started kind of creeping into my art more images that I saw, um, my work started being influenced by it. And um, so I've created a lot of works that, um, you know, it was just sort of intuitive thing. I just started adding these uh, images into my work and they found their way in there. I love that. This is the first thing I saw right here. You're seeing this amazing site. I don't know what that was. But I created some uh, films and different images um, that uh, caught my eye and uh, just amazed me. They're very simple, uh, beautiful, and it's their beauty that caught me at first. I didn't realize how important they were when I was first seeing them. I just thought they were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. Uh, and like I say, I related to them. They're like crystals, little glass houses. Um, you can see a little bit of diversity. This is all from Apalachicola Bay, the centric diatom I was talking about. This is a sea hag. Um, and, and a Megan, ha beautiful by Megan uh, micrograph. Um, so um, that was just like this three minute blast of a 14 minute uh, film that uh, should play well for you uh, by just hitting that, that YouTube link, link that you'll see on your screen later. Okay, thank you, Beth. And we apologize that, that our sound is not catching up with our video. That's fine. I have put the links to all the videos in the chat and they're all very worthwhile watching. Um, if we don't have any questions, Alicia, I, I don't see any questions. Um, I would like to thank everybody, especially Beth uh, Appleton for her, her hard work on this. She, she worked many, many, many hours on the exhibit. Um, and thank you, Melanie and Megan, for your work on the exhibit and also being on the Sci Cafe. And I'd like to thank Alicia Bruno. She's been our producer for this session. And wanted to thank all of you for tuning in. And our next Sci Cafe will be on April 20th. And Rebecca Doolin will be talking to us about the biodiversity in Apalachicola, in the Apalachicola Bay region. So uh, thank you very much, and we hope to see you next time, and we hope to see you at the exhibit, which will be here until June.